A very good morning to all of you on behalf of Marine Ecology Laboratory, Presidency University, Kolkata, and Jack Perfil. A very warm welcome to all the participants joining us today for the third talk of our monthly colloquium by Dr. Andrew Lorer from National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, Hamilton, New Zealand. I would now request Dr. Shumit Mondal, Assistant Professor in the Department of Life Sciences, Presidency University, Kolkata, to introduce our honorable guest. So over to you, sir. Please present the slide. Okay. Thank you, Sitama. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all for this monthly colloquium series organized by Marine Ecology Laboratory in association with Aquafile. This is our third speaker on, in this series. So today we are lucky to have with us Dr. Andrew M. Lohrer, Principal Scientist and Group Manager, Marine Ecology, National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, NIWA, Hamilton, New Zealand. So his research area encompasses various aspects of marine benthic ecology, primary production, nutrient dynamics in soft sediment habitats, bioturbation of sediments by macrofauna, disturbance and recovery process, etc. So he has obtained his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from University of Connecticut, USA. He has many awards and achievements to his credits. Two of them are he is expedition leader and PI for resilience in Antarctic biota, biota and ecosystem and has participated seven expeditions to Antarctica. Furthermore, he is coordinator for Interact initiative to develop coastal Antarctic time series data and serve as an expert panel for land and water forum, New Zealand Ministry of Environment. He is an executive committee member for Ocean Government's Governance Think Tank Panel and Society for Conservation Biology. He is editorial board member for scientific reports, ecological research, and reviewer for more than 30 reputed international journals. So he has supervised 10 doctoral theses and contributed nearly 80 citation index journal articles more than five book chapters, 37 reports, and two conference proceedings papers, and having phenomenal 3,870 citations with H index 33 and I10 60. One of his paper at Nature titled Bioturbation, Bioturbator Enhanced Ecosystem Function through Complex Biogeochemical Interaction in 2004 has a phenomenal 4,092 citation till date. With this brief introduction, I am requesting Dr. Lohrer to deliver his talk, Cascades of Change After Affect Coastal Sea Port Diversity and Ecosystem Function in Antarctica. Over to you, Dr. Lohrer. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to present um, my, hang on a second. Okay, it should be coming now. So, um, Sumit san, thank you for the introduction. Please let me know if you can't see my slide. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's coming. Okay, thank good. You. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yes, it's um, a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Sumit san. Um, in Japan, which is why I call him Sumit-san, and uh, we're a good friend. So it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so it's evening here in New Zealand. So my name is Drew Lohrer, and uh, I work at NIWA. So that's the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research um, here in New Zealand. And today um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work I do in Antarctica. This is a, a proportion of the work I do. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting part of my job. So the title of my talk is Climate Cascades Affect Coastal Seafloor Diversity. 
and ecosystem function in Antarctica. <clears throat> so I'd just like to acknowledge that this work um, is not just my own. There's several people that have been involved, um, in, especially my colleagues from the University of Auckland, Simon Thrush, and some colleagues from the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, Professor Alf Norko, uh, as well as a variety of colleagues from my own institution, NIWA. Also, if after this talk, if you have questions or want to um, see some more information, you can type into your web browser, science under the ice, um, and you will come up with um, our Facebook page, which has lots of videos and stories and vignettes, which you can use um, to get more information about our, our work down um, in Antarctica. <clears throat> so before I get um, too deep into the science talk, I thought I would just remind you of where Antarctica is. Um, this is the continental land mass of Antarctica. So unlike the Arctic, it's not um, just ice that floats on the, on the pole. It's actually a land mass, a very large continental land mass at the um, South Pole. And um, as a continent, it's a desert, effectively. It's the driest continent. It's the coldest continent. Um, it has the highest average wind speed of any continent. It's also, believe it or not, has the highest average elevation of any continent. Um, the, at the pole, it's about 3,800 meters elevation. And most of that is um, thousands of meters of ice. Um, so the ice is super thick. There's ice um, sheets that cover most of the continent. So you've probably heard in the media or through your studies um, some information about what is changing in the, the waters around Antarctica. And you've probably all heard about ocean acidification, which is the reduction in pH that's due to higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So the more um, CO2 we pump into the atmosphere from our cars and stuff, um, the lower the pH of the oceans goes. This is particularly a big problem in Antarctica because the water around Antarctica is so cold and the solubility of CO2 in, in seawater is higher when the water is cold. So it's a big problem in Antarctica in particular. Um, also warming, if it's a very cold place and you get a bit of warming, you're going to get glacial melt and you'll get some runoff of fresh water into the oceans and changes in the stratification or the layering of the surface ocean water in addition to warming. And uh, what that means in terms of the biology is that there are some changes that are occurring, um, either observed already or predicted to occur in the phytoplankton. So this is the base of the entire marine food web. It supports the krill and all the way up to the big whales and things. Um, and in particular with the freshening and the stratification, they're predicting changes in the size structure of the phytoplankton, as well as the abundance of the phytoplankton. And another big change obviously is the loss of sea ice. So I should have mentioned that I showed the continental land mass of Antarctica, but in the winter, um, there's a huge amount of ocean that freezes and in the summer that sea ice um, breaks apart and uh, floats out to sea again. Um, but there's changes in the amount of sea ice that's, that's um, covering the ocean uh, at the end of winter in Antarctica. So uh, the sea ice is getting thinner. Um, the extent, so the distance that it extends offshore from the coast is changing and the permanence, so how long it stays in position before it breaks apart is changing. And one thing I mentioned here is the under ice algae. So unlike some of the thick ice shelves that occur around Antarctica, the sea ice, which forms every year, um, there's luxuriant growth of algae underneath the ice. And so that's a, another part of the food chain along with phytoplankton. So these changes in sea ice and the changes in warming and acidification, they're affecting the food chain. And I'm a marine benthic ecologist, so I study the seafloor, and I wanna know what the consequences of these changes are for the seafloor organisms. <clears throat> so this is a picture of what the underside of uh, 
annual or the first year of fast ice looks like in Antarctica. So when the ice forms um, during winter, uh, it's about two meters thick and that's thin enough for some sunlight to penetrate through the ice and you get a very luxuriant growth of under ice algae on the underside of the sea ice. And this algae is an important part of the food chain along with the phytoplankton and it supports a very rich and luxuriant benthic fauna. So it's kind of interesting on top of the um, water in Antarctica, everything is white, it's very icy and it's relatively lifeless. You, you don't see much biology except for maybe some penguins, a few seabirds, marine, marine birds. But underneath the ice in the ocean itself, you get phenomenal colors and densities and abundance and diversity of organisms. I'll just show you a few examples. Some of these organisms are quite extraordinary. <clears throat> um, first of all, you get a lot of sponge life and suspension or filter feeding organisms. These are some, that's an anemone. You can see over here, there's a fan worm. We've got a soft coral, some bryozoans. Um, the abundances of the animals or the densities can be quite high as well. So this is a type of sea star, obviously. They're um, feeding on something that's either died or that one of them has preyed upon and there's a big feeding pile. But you see very, very high densities of organisms. You see some extraordinary things as well. So this is a nemertine worm. So in New Zealand, we might find nemertines in the sediment and they may be um, maybe five centimeters long maximum. In the Antarctic, you get some gigantic animals. So this animal is about a meter in length. So it's a very large worm. Uh, this is a scallop, an Antarctic scallop. You can see the little eye spots here. Um, this animal could be up to 100 years old. So that it's very stable. A cold environment. Um, and I mentioned the pH. So when acidification begins to occur, these organisms are going to be particularly vulnerable because they make a calcium carbonate shell and that will be eroded as the uh, water becomes more acidic. These organisms have quite a thin shell to begin with because in the Antarctic there are no crabs, there's no lobsters, there's no crushing predators. So these organisms have evolved in a place where they don't need thick shells. So when acidification occurs, these will be quite easily eroded. Uh, this is a sea spider, a pycnogonid. Um, again, we might see tiny little ones of these in our samples from New Zealand. This one here is about the size of a dinner plate. So it's very, very large. Um, this is a fan worm, a sabellid polychaete. Um, and also notice that some of the rocks have coralline algae and there's a little bit of, um, of macro algae, one species at the latitudes that I go to, but that's it. Most of the seabed is covered by animals only. There's very little algae. Uh, this is a nudibranch. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you can appreciate why I like to go down to the Antarctic and study these beautiful marine creatures. Um, and hopefully you'll get to go down there someday yourselves. Um, so I'm from New Zealand. And when we go down to the Antarctic for research expeditions, we fly down. So we fly down on a jet. So I'm from Hamilton, which is right in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand. We fly to Christchurch, which is a staging area. And that's about a five hour jet, um, jet airplane ride down to McMurdo Sound, um, which is in the Ross Sea. So I believe that Sumitsan, when he has been to the Antarctic, he's gone to the peninsula, which is over here. But we go down to McMurdo Sound. And I've colored in here, these are ice shelves. Ice shelves are different than the annual sea ice I talked about. These are basically the extension of glaciers. And these are hundreds of meters thick but they do extend out over um, the seawater. So they're not part of the continental land mass, but they extend out over the seawater. But where I've pointed to in McMurdo Sound, that's about 77 degrees south latitude. 
but effectively those are the southernmost accessible marine habitats anywhere on the planet. So it's as far south as you can go and still have uh, marine habitats to, to study effectively in the way that we do. <clears throat> so New Zealand's research station in Antarctica is called Scott Base. So it's at the tip of Ross Island. So this is Ross Island right here. Um, this is McMurdo Sound that I mentioned. This is the, the ice shelf, the thick ice shelf. And so Scott Base is right at the edge of the ice shelf and where the sea ice begins. And we've done our work in, in, in and around McMurdo Sound. So I'll be mentioning these sites a few times, so you should maybe become familiar with them. So this is Cape Evans, and it's on the, the western side of Ross Island. This one is called New Harbor. Um, and then this one up here is called Granite Harbor. So just to talk about um, why we go down to McMurdo Sound and why we study these sites in particular, the ones I'm going to talk about today. So uh, firstly, again, they're the southernmost sites on the planet that are still accessible to divers or people that want to sample them in any regular way. Um, they're also thought to be, because of their position in the Ross Sea and because of their southernmost location, they're, they're thought to be one of the last places predicted to respond to climate change. So McMurdo Sound is not experiencing the amount of change that is occurring on the Antarctic Peninsula. On the peninsula, there's very rapid warming and really dramatic change in terms of sea ice coverage and um, ecology. But in McMurdo Sound, it's been relatively isolated from this, the warming and it, it's predicted to be one of the last places to change. The other reason we like to study McMurdo Sound is that the currents, the, um, basically there's a gradient in food that's driven by oceanography and it's pretty well known. So the currents run from the north to the south along the western side of Ross Island and they bring food rich water that's from the open water that's north, north of um, the sites. This, this um, warm, this uh, food rich water then flows underneath this very thick ice shelf, which is hundreds of meters thick. It circulates around for a while. It squirts out on this side of the ice shelf. So it comes out from after being underneath uh, hundreds of meters of ice in pitch darkness. And when it comes out the other side, this water is very, very food poor. So there's a very big gradient in food supply between sites that are effectively the same latitude. And so one of the reasons we study these sites is that um, food production or primary productivity is predicted to increase with global climate change. And by studying these sites that are along a gradient in food supply, we're better able to predict how these food poor sites will change in the future as they become richer. So hopefully that explains why, why we go to this part of the world and what we can achieve by sampling these sites. I should have also mentioned that in addition to the food supply that's driven by oceanography, so the phytoplankton, food supply is also dri quite driven by sea ice conditions. And in this part, the western side of Ross Island, um, there's basically an annual sea ice breakout. So there's open water here. So it's productive because the sunlight can get into the water and the stimulate the phytoplankton. But on the um, this side of McMurdo Sound, basically they've had very thick sea ice that hasn't broken apart and drifted out to sea uh, for more than a decade. And that contributed to the lack of food at these sites on this side of the sound. But this is starting to change now. So in the early 2000s, this was the scenario where we had open water up here in this sort of sector one, um, and, but thick ice coverage across these parts. But after 2010, there was a breakout and increasingly from 2014 to 2017 and actually continuing on 20 through 2019 at least, there's been um, breakouts of sea ice throughout the entire McMurdo Sound all the way down to the ice shelf. And so that's really had a change in the access of sites, particularly sites such as New Harbor, to food rich conditions. 
So it's really changed the food supply. So just to summarize this, uh, these are the three sites I showed on the uh, graph previously, on the map previously. In, if you look at the dates from 2000 to 2009, so the early 2000s, um, there were fewer ice-free days than there were in the later part, of, so after 2010. So, and that's true across all three sites. And similarly, the sites, the, these three sites, they were, um, they've been closer to the ice edge, which means they're more, they're greater proximity to the productive open water in the recent years. So these 2010 to 2017 relative to the past years. So there's been big changes in the ice conditions and that has contributed to big changes in the access of these sites or the organisms at these sites to food supply. Okay. So <clears throat> I should also mention that these changes in ice were thought to be driven primarily by icebergs, believe it or not. So there was a big iceberg that was grounded right north of Ross Island in the early part of the, the new millennium, so the, in the 2000s to 2010. Um, and this blocked the, ax, the exit of ice. So this ice was unable to break up and that's why we had um, fewer ice-free days and greater distance to the ice edge. But once that iceberg, the big mega iceberg drifted away, we started getting much more um, open water and um, closer proximity to, of the sites to the ice edge. But in the background, there's the climate has also definitely been changing. So this is an index of climate. Um, and it's not really that important to know what it means. But if you look in the um, recent times, so past 2010, um, this index has been in positive territory in seven of the eight years. Whereas in the early part of uh, the new millennium, the 2000 to 2010, we were getting m much more of this index that was in the negative. I also mentioned that there was a lot of breakouts that happened in particular after 2014. So this is a different climate index and it shows that after 2014, this index again moved into positive territory. You can see the big difference between the 2000s to 2010 and the 2010 onwards. There's big differences in this in the climate. And effectively, once this thing goes into positive territory, um, we're getting much more frequent ice breakout. So the changes we're seeing in sea ice conditions are not only driven by icebergs, they're driven by climate change. And I guess I should also mention that we've sampled these sites um, over time. So in addition to the food gradient I showed in McMurdo Sound spatially, we also sent, were able to sample these sites at different times. So we sampled Granite Harbor before and after these changes in the sea ice conditions. And we sampled New Harbor before and after these big changes in sea ice conditions. So that's a bit of data background. I'll show you some photographs of what I mean. And it's quite easy to understand the differences. <clears throat> oh, I should also just mention, this is what it looks like from a satellite. So this is what the the ocean looks like when the sea ice has completely broken out. So the very extensive breakout in 2016. This is the thick ice shelf. And this is all open ocean water. And here's our three sites. You can see that the ice broke out all the way inshore to the site at New Harbor in 2016. Um, this is the same image, but from a year later, and you can see that the ice didn't break out all the way into the New Harbor site, but it was very close. The other sites have open water at, um, during this year. <clears throat> so this is New Harbor in 2009, the first time we sampled it. This was after about a decade of no local sea ice breakout at the site. And you can see that the ice is quite um, lumpy. It's covered with snow drifts. There was actually a lot of gravel and dust on the sea ice as well, because there was grass, gravel that was blowing off of the land in the dry valleys. Uh, and the ice was about four and a half meters thick. So this is very thick sea ice. And you can imagine underneath all that snow, gravel, and thick sea ice, 
there was zero light that was getting through that ice. So there was no under ice algae or any productivity underneath that ice during the first year we sampled. We went back again in 2017, more, much more recently, and I just showed the satellite images. This is basically, the ice was about three and a half meters thick, but it had only been in place for effectively two seasons. It was much smoother. There was much less snow coverage on top, much less gravel. And underneath we could see there was much more light that was getting through to the undersurface of the ice. And it was only a year removed from complete breakout of the site. <clears throat> so this is the seafloor at New Harbor site in 20, 2009. So this was after this long period without any new food. So the sea ice was very thick, it was pitch black underwater, and um, this is what the seafloor looked like at that time. I'll also point you to these chambers. I'm going to talk about the data from these later. This is where we measure um, fluxes of oxygen and nutrients across the sediment water interface. And they're a good measure of um, the metabolism or productivity of the system. Anyway, these are about 50 centimeters on a side. That gives you an idea of scale. Uh, and these are some scallop shells. Many of them are empty because the animals were not surviving very well. So this is, again, 2009. We went back in 2017 and it looked quite a bit different. So you can see these are the same chambers. So again, 50 centimeters on the side, but now we've got much more life on the seafloor. We've got this new um, sponges. These are bryozoans um, and uh, ascidians. So lots sort of like this explosion of life as a result of the injection of food that happened with the sea ice breakout. Just another view of what the sea ice, uh, what the sea floor looks like. Um, we've got um, scallops, uh, various types of sponges, but again, the bryozoans and these um, sponges called homaxanella, they were the most common organisms we found on the sea floor. Um, they had greatly increased in abundance since, the la since our prior visit. <clears throat> so the three most um, the tacks that changed the most were ascidians, so these are tunicates, they're filter feeding organisms, bryozoans, so that's a, an arborescent or tree-like um, branching bryozoan, it's also a filter feeder, and these homaxanellid sponges, so these are the sponges, um, they're called bush sponges, and again they're filter feeders. All of these organisms are opportunistic species, um, and they're all filter feeding species. They seem to take advantage of this new injection of food that happened as a result of these recent sea ice breakouts. This is a picture of a burrowing urchin, but the real reason I'm showing the photograph is to show you this brown material that you can see on top of the sediment. That's the under ice algal material or phytoplankton material but it's microalgal material. And effectively that's the food supply that has been increasing as a result of the sea ice breakout. So with the um, changes in sea ice, we're getting an injection of food it's falling down to the seafloor. And the way we measure the food content in the seafloor is that we examine the chlorophyll A content of the sediment. So if you look at 2009, there was much less chlorophyll A, this algal pigment in the sediment, than there was in 2017. In fact, four times less food in 2009 than there was in 2017. And, and the metabolism of the benthic ecosystem also changed as a result. So in 2009, the, the benthic oxygen demand, the sediment oxygen demand was about five times lower than it was in 2017. So we've got pretty good evidence that the animals responded quite prolifically. Um, there was increases in the sediment algal um, chlorophyll A content and the seabed metabolism, the benthic oxygen demand was all changing and increasing. <clears throat> but more recently what we've studied, we've come to understand, we've analyzed the data across five different expeditions. So the two from New Harbor that I mentioned, 
but also two different expeditions at Granite Harbor, one in the early 2000s prior to these changes in sea ice and one after the more recent changes in sea ice with more food available. And then our third site, which I mentioned is a food rich site to begin with. If you look at the sediment food content, so this algal food material in the sediment, you can see there's a strong gradient across the sites. It's what I talked about previously. But you can see how the biogeochemistry, this ecosystem metabolism responds, not perfectly, but it's correlated. When you have high food content, you have high oxygen demand, you have high nitrogen efflux coming out of the sediment, so more inorganic nutrients are being regenerated and more phosphate efflux. And I also, I showed you pictures of epifauna, so the ascidians, the bryozoans, and the sponges. But here are data on the infauna, so the things that Sumetsan and I like to study, the polychaete worms and all of the infauna. You can see how with increasing sediment chlorophyll A content, you get an increase um, in the abundance or the density of the macrofauna in the sediments as well. So again, this is really interesting. We're seeing consistent patterns in increases in food, increases in seabed metabolism, increases in the infauna, and increases in the epifauna. And I guess this is sort of a fancy way of saying the same thing. So this is macrofauna community structure. So rather than abundance or anything, we look in a multivariate way. We look at all the species. And if species here, um, if they're further away, it means they're more different. The, the circles, so the, this blue color and the green color, these samples are more similar to each other. So New Harbor in 2009 is more similar to samples in New Harbor in 2017 than it is to samples at Cape Evans. In 20, um, so, so there's differences across locations, but interestingly, there's also differences across time. So the samples after these changes in sea ice seem to be more similar to the food-rich sites. And you can see that um, the thing that's driving this, these patterns in macrobenthic community structure are the things like sediment food content, the chlorophyll A, and it's consistent with increased um, uh, oxygen demand in this direction and increased nutrient efflux. So it's all very interesting that it's all quite correlated with each other. Increases in food, so this chlorophyll A content, and indicators of ecosystem metabolism are all correlated with in-fauna community structure. <clears throat> so I guess one of the key findings, uh, one of the things, reasons why this is interesting to us is that especially in the Ross Sea and in this part of the world, the paradigm or the theory was that it's a very stable environment, super cold. So the water temperature is negative 1.9 at New Harbor. And it stays that way for most of the year. So it's very thermally stable. It's thought to be very slow changing. Um, but what we were seeing is actually relatively rapid change. So this is kind of like a bit of a surprise. And there's some other evidence that um, Antarctic systems can change surprisingly quickly as well. Um, Paul Dayton, who's kind of a legend in, in the Antarctic literature, also reported on very rapid increases in sponges. Um, basically in a 10 year period, these sponges went from recruitment to more than 75 kilograms. Um, these are fantastic papers if you want to have a read of them. And I guess the question I often get asked um, at the end of these talks is, so if climate change is occurring and the ice is breaking apart, and one of the results of that is increases in food supply. And that basically means that there's going to be higher diversity and abundance of animals. Isn't that a kind of a good thing? And I guess the answer is we, we really don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing yet. The responses that we saw were these very opportunistic species. Um, 
the, the sponges, the ascidians, and the bryozoans, they're all opportunistic species and they're filter feeders. Those changes in those species may soon be followed by changes in predator abundance. Um, and there could be other shifts as well. There's a lot of complex interactions that we don't fully understand yet. So we can't necessarily say, oh sure, it's just a good thing yet. But I just want to leave you um, with uh, the final thoughts that these are very uh, unique and iconic marine systems. We don't fully understand them yet, but we know enough now to say that they are potentially vulnerable to climate change, acidification, ocean warming, and some of these other anthropogenic stressors. So um, that's basically all I've, I've got for you today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, happy to take questions from anyone uh, afterwards. Um, and I, I would like to thank uh, my team. So this is a very big effort. Um, when we go down to the Antarctic, we have an event a number that you label all of your samples and all of your gear. And so this is our event number. Uh, I also want to thank the funding agency, which is the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute and also Antarctica New Zealand who do the logistics for all of this. This is a very um, difficult uh, bit of work that we do because we camp on sea ice and it's very gear and labor intensive. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, with that, I think I'll exit out of my talk and um, and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lawler, for such a nice talk. And uh, really, it's fascinating to know that uh, so much result you got from last one decade from that area. Mm. So I, I, I have one uh, simple question that, uh, as you told, that uh, the gigantism will increase in these areas, or maybe the uh, those species which are more opportunistic or uh, predator, these uh, these species will day by day may increase in that area. So it it will definitely have some uh, negative impact on the food uh, wave or uh, food chain in that area. So what is your opinion in that? <clears throat> yeah, it's um it could be it could be uh, yeah quite interesting to find out how how that will play out. Um, we haven't seen increases in um, the, the, the gigantism or the sizes of the organisms themselves yet. Mostly right now, it's we're seeing this change in abundance um, and um, in somewhat in diversity as well. Um, but there are these very iconic organisms in the Antarctic that may be lost or may change. So one of the um, very large organisms that we showed was, was the nemertine worm. And those are very important predators down there. So if they start to catch up with this elevated food supply and they start mowing things down, um, then that could be uh, quite problematic. So another hypothesis uh, has been come up that due to the global warming, the regional shifting of these species may occur in coming decades. So if uh, the sub-Antarctic species, uh, they move towards the Antarctic region due to the global warming scenario. So mm -hmm. that will also have some uh, impact on that ecosystem. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, that, that's correct. And <clears throat> I think that's a bit further in the future, but one prediction is that um, if there's enough warming, some of the uh, large crustaceans will be able to emerge up the, sh the shelf slopes a bit. And these deep sea, um, like king crabs and different things like that can start to march up into the Antarctic and as I, uh, into the coastal zone rather. And as I mentioned, um, many of those species are not very well equipped to deal with crushing predators. Um, and so that is potentially a very big um, issue. It's a bit, controversial. Some people don't think that that's actually a realistic prediction, um, but others say it's possible. I think either way, it will be a little bit in the future. It would take a while for the warming um, to be get warm enough that they could start to um, kind of their depth of those predators could march up the shelf and um, into the coastal zone. So Thank you again uh, from my side and uh, whatever the photographs you saw, uh, showed us today. So I got most of these pieces, I guess.
and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and i can see that uh, the nima times also i got and then uh, the sea spider also i got the same yeah. same size what you so showed us today so yeah. let's see in future uh, how we can identify that and we may need your yeah. help in that also okay yep. over to there's, yeah there's yep. very good there's very good online um guides available at least for the mcmurdo sound um ross sea region and most of the fauna is pretty well known so that's quite helpful um yeah. the, the in fauna is a little bit less known that's more difficult mm -hmm. the small polychaetes and things but yeah, yeah it's it's pretty good did um also did you get on the antarctic peninsula did you get macro algae um kelp and things like that yeah we got but as uh, i'm not uh, focused on algal part so i didn't uh, get the samples so yeah i i have only focused on the ap fauna and in fauna of that area and uh, even, yeah. even we are we are want to study the meo fauna also from that area yeah so, all the so yeah uh, i should it, mention that where we are so far south at 77 south that um basically there's no macro algae um, okay. It's sort of beyond the southern limit of macroalgae. Mm -hmm. um, there's one very small red alga species um, that is at Cape Evans and Granite mm -hmm. Harbor, but it doesn't. It's not at New Harbor, and so it's quite okay. a different community. Again, as I mentioned, these mm -hmm. are very southern communities, and they're really yeah, yeah. unique. Really unique. Our, yeah. our area was in the Pids Bay area. In, that, uh, in those area, we have collected the samples. Ah, okay. Yeah. So. Okay, uh, over to uh, Sitama for question and discussion. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lorer, for enlightening us with such an informative talk. I would like to express our sincere thanks to you for giving an excellent coverage on problems coastal sea floor diversity and ecosystem functioning are facing in Antarctica, which is really an area of global concern. We are really grateful for the valuable time you shared with us from your busy schedule. Now we will be moving on to some of the questions which have arrived in the chat box. Mm. So let's take them one by one. Sure. Okay, the first question is from Procheta Pal. She is asking, is the magnitude of ocean acidification higher in Antarctica than the rest of the world? And if it is so, it is why? Uh, so the, the answer is yes. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, it's because the the water is so cold in Antarctica that the solubility of atmospheric CO2 into the seawater is greater. So it can hold more CO2 and that is what's driving the acidification. So they predict that um, at the, the calcium carbonate saturation depth is actually getting shallower and shallower and at some stage soon it will be near the surface waters and it's not very far in the future maybe only 20 years in the future that they're worried about um, the the ability of bivalves and pteropods and other very important creatures for the marine food webs to be affected so it is a very big problem and it is more problematic in the antarctic than elsewhere okay next question is from nomita bhumi is asking if I want to classify the benthic circumference of Antarctica, what would be the major benthic ecoregions? Well, that, that's a difficult question. Um, so there are, um, you know, there's research bases all around the whole continent. So Australia has bases and um, Japan has bases and there's, well, most of the research is out on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, I'm really, forgive my ignorance, but I'm really mostly only familiar with the Ross Sea region of Antarctica and the Victoria Land Coast. So the coast that um, starts where New Harbor was, that site, but extending all the way up to the edge of, of the, that mountain range. Um, but interestingly, um, as Sumit-san mentioned, many of these organisms are found all around Antarctica. They're circumpolar because the way the currents go, Basically, um, the, the, the currents flow all the way around the continent. And so there's a lot of connectivity and many of the populations are, occur all around the, the whole um, circumference of Antarctica. Okay, she's also asked another question. 
if i consider the trait modalities of body size what the largest sized organisms are comparatively preferred in benthic zones of antarctica like um, why they are preferred more yeah so why are there why is this gigantism um so prevalent in the antarctic um i don't think people fully understand why that is i think um could be that some of the large sizes are the result of the cold temperatures which makes them grow slower but then for longer they um continue to grow for longer um there there's some um body size and temperature um relationships in terrestrial ecology as well um but i don't think they necessarily apply to cold blooded invertebrate organisms so um again uh, forgive me but i don't i don't know if there is a good answer to that or if i know the answer <laughs> the next question is from priya goshal so she is asking if if ecosystem metabolism decreases suddenly then what will happen with the infernal community um well the ecosystem metabolism in some ways is a is a measure of what the infernal community is doing so if you have lots of food in the sediment and you have lots of microbial activity and you have lots of infernal activity the microbes and the infauna as they degrade the algal material they're consuming oxygen so they're burning it basically they're burning the carbon and um so that's why you get higher oxygen demand um and then as they remineralize the organic matter they convert it into inorganic nutrients so that's why we were seeing greater flux of nitrogen and phosphorus so um i'm not sure that um that ecosystem metabolism will decrease and cause an effect on the infaunal community it's more like they're very closely interrelated and the infauna is partly what's driving the fluxes but it's it's a way that we can use so the the ecosystem metabolism is a way for us to understand the rates of material processing and the rates at which the sea floor community is using this new food material that's arriving okay. thank you sir next question is from divisha bishash she is asking is is it possible that the climate change may invite more and more invasion by alien species in antarctica if so then how will it affect the existing benthic community so that's a good question um it it is certainly possible that it will um invite in invasion by alien species um as it's already happening on the antarctic peninsula in the terrestrial environment they've definitely had invasions by non-indigenous species um if it warms up a little bit obviously species that are not quite as cold tolerant may suddenly be able to survive and then the other thing to remember is that the oceanographic patterns may change with climate as well so you might be getting species that are being um funneled from um south america or elsewhere and they they're now able to reach antarctica where they weren't previously able to so it could it could result in invasions by alien species and finally the the comment about the crabs um suddenly accessing these coastal marine communities that have never been exposed to crushing predators before that could be a big big problem Okay we have another question from Vinita Ghosh she is asking sir how do you think the coastal geomorphology in antarctica would contribute to the variation in the nutrient and chlorophyll a concentration and hence to the change in benthic fauna with change in the I mean, changing ice scenario yeah um i if i understand the co question correctly it's about the you know the shapes of the 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 landscape the geomorphology of the landscape and the bays and different things and certainly um that plays a role at the local scale um there's there's areas that do not break out um partly just because they're little protected coves and they're um and the the ice once it freezes it's difficult for that ice to break apart or be broken apart by waves and so that certainly does affect um the local communities we we do find quite a strong relationship between the thickness of the sea ice and the marine communities below and that does vary on the local scale due to geomorphological features um 
or proximity to ice shelves or other things like that. So yeah, good question. And it certainly could change um, the, the proximity of the sites to open water and the access to the under ice algae. Okay, so I have one question to you. Since you're working for a long time in this, in this region, so uh, ocean acidification is a prevalent problem, uh, we know, all over the globe. So what is the changes in the sediment pH in the ocean flow where you are working? Because we know that the ocean surface is getting, like lower pH is there, they, it is a prediction and there is a problem. But what about the seabed? Uh, is the sediment pH is also like changing? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think everything will be changing slightly. I mean, one kind of interesting thing about the Antarctic sediments is, um, especially at a place like New Harbor, is that the sediments are very coarse grained and the organic content is very, very low. So it, it's a little bit unlike sediments up in the temperate zone where you get steep gradients of organic content and steep gradients of oxygen or pH. Essentially, you have a, an oxic layer of sediment that can be eight or ten centimeters, so it's quite quite a deep oxic zone. Um, but that kind of thing is the kind of stuff that may start to change if we start to get this elevated food. Um, obviously, if you have organisms that are respiring this elevated food and um, putting CO2 into the pore water, you're going to get local acidification in the sediments and things like that. So um, I can't answer your question completely, but I think there will be changes um, related to climate and this elevated food supply um, to acidification of the sediments um, and the benthos. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Once again, I'll take the opportunity to thank Dr. Laura for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Cool. It's my, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. And um, you're always welcome. I, I had my um, email on the, the first slide. If you want to follow up with anything, please, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Lola -san. Okay. Good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.